all the comments. Okay, the comment I think you submitted yeah. online, right? Yes. Yeah. The comment box didn't show up. Uh, Thank you. On the second assignment, so I had to look at it. And not the grades on the assignments. Okay, I'll dig into it. Okay, so Sora was also having the same problem. Uh, but I guess, did you look at the comments on the PDF? Uh, no. So just scroll the PDF, you will see comments on the side. Okay. Uh, all right, so today uh, we are going to complete the, the discussion on multi arm bandit that we were doing, particularly the paper by, uh, by Lai and Robbins. So I hope everyone remembers the notation. Uh, regret mu of t is summation of delta i, expected value of t i capital T, i equals one to n, so there are n arms. And we had uh, talked about the fact that regret is bounded, so we have assumptions, a lot of assumptions that imply limit t, t goes to infinity, regret of mu t over log t is equal to, is greater than equal to summation delta j over dkl theta j theta star delta j greater than 0. Okay, and the third thing that we were, we talked about in the previous class was we can actually achieve this regret uh, by using upper confidence bound. So, upper confidence bound G T T, which maps R T, so samples from T, uh, observations of reward to some value in R. And I had mentioned a few properties that these upper, upper confidence bound should satisfy. Okay, and we were considering the following example. So we are standing at t equals to 100. I have t1, t equals to 5. I have m hat 1, t equals to Okay, and one of the things that we had discussed is if we want to explore, so we have explored arm one, fewer number of times, we have explored arm two uh, a lot of times, and we have found that arm two consistently has given us very high average reward, whereas arm one has not. So one of the ideas that came from this class was why don't we bump up the mean and try and explore the arms that have not been explored well enough. Okay, that was the idea we were thinking about. Okay. So we define the, so now I want to com construct the asymptotically optimal policy mu that achieves this regret, the lower bound on the regret so how do we do that? So pick delta in 0 comma 1 over n. So n is the number of arms. 
define j star t to be r max of m hat j sorry capital t m hat j capital t such that t j t is greater than equal to delta t naturally delta has to be a small number not a large number and we define u j capital t equals to g t t j t of y i y j 1 y j 2 y j t j t these are the rewards rewards uh, observed from arm j okay so i'm not writing x because x has a time dependence this one is just the first few rewards that you have observed from a particular arm j Let's parse through these equations. So I pick a delta between 0 and 1 over n. Uh, perhaps uh, delta has to be sufficiently small. And then I pick the arm, the optimal arm, among all the arms that, been, that has been pulled at least delta t times. Okay? This delta is supposed to be constant for the entire horizon. Then I construct this, use this upper confidence bound function and look at all the rewards that I have received from arm j until now. So there are only tjt samples of rewards that I have observed so far. I plug that thing in, in the upper confidence bound functions, these functions, and I construct ujt, which is a random variable. It depends on the reward distribution and the choice of upper confidence bound function that we have picked. Uh, don't confuse this u with the small u, which is the action. So let me make it capital U. So this is some upper confidence bound. Okay. And then the policy mu is as follows. So mu capital T, I capital T. So I capital T is all the information you have accrued. It's T mod N if M hat J star T at T is less than U T mod N capital T. and it's J star capital T otherwise. This is capital U here. Okay, and their result is uh, regret with this policy 
at time t, no, I need to take a limb soup. So, under all the assumptions, uh, assumptions imply limb soup t goes to infinity. log t is less than equal to summation delta j over dkl theta j theta star plus some error that is arbitrarily small, that can be made arbitrarily small. can be made as small as we want. Let's think about it uh, in this particular context. So this is the arm that has not been explored much. Okay, so if I am at, so there are only three arms. So let's say I am at 97, 98, well 97 is already passed, so 100. Uh, 101, 102, okay? So, T mod N is equal to 1 here and T mod N is equal to 2 here. T mod N is equal to 3 here, okay? Now, I have observed the rewards from individual arms, so I'm going to plug it into this particular function and I'm just going to write something. Uh, U1t is equal to uh, $6, U2t is equal to $5.25, U3t equals to $5.25. Seven five. Okay, so I've computed by plugging in these values. I've computed these upper confidence bound. Now, at time t equals to hundred, my m two of t is dollar five, and this is the best arm that has been explored seventy times. And I have to pick delta also. So let me put delta equals to one over six. So hundred over six is. What's 100 over 6? Come on. 16, yeah, okay. So 100 over 6 is 16. So my J star of, J star of 100 is arm 2. Because arm 2 and arm 3, they have been explored at least 16 times or 17 times. And arm 2 has the maximum reward for all the arms that have been pulled at least 17 times. Okay, so J star 100 is equal to 2. Now, when I am at T equals to 100, I have to check the upper confidence bound of this and J star of whatever the M hat of T is. So, M hat, M hat of J star 100 of T is equal to, is equal to $5. Okay, so at t equals to 100, I have to look at the upper confidence bound of arm 1 
So that's t mod, mod n, so that's equal to 1. So I have to look at this number and this number and pick the arm that has the maximum value. So certainly in, in this case, arm 1 has a maximum, has a higher value, so therefore I'm going to pick arm 1 at this time. Then I go to arm 2 and I look at 5.25 and dollar 5. So of course, uh, this turns out to be, so in, in, in the second, so at time t equals to 101, I have to pick arm 2 because it's the same value. Um, at t equals to 102, I have to look at the upper confidence bound on, of, of arm 3, and I have to look at the mean observed from arm 2, and of course this one has a higher value, so therefore I'm going to pick arm 3. And that's how it's going to continue. Sorry, you can you? Yeah, why we are comparing with the same value? I think with every iteration, G star should be changed. Correct. This part will be changing, but I'm not expecting it to change much in this situation for this particular example okay. that we are considering. But you are right that it will. All of this has to be recomputed at every point of time. Yeah. Okay, and so you will make use of all the information you have accrued in order to compute these values. Yeah. So you said that uj of t was a random variable? Yes, well, because it depends on all the observed. Well, then doesn't it have to be the expectation of, of uh, u t mod n of t in the policy statement? Otherwise, it's a random variable and we're not uh, choosing based off a defined quantity. Uh, so this is a random variable. This is a random variable. You are just computing the Diff the realizations of two random variables. Okay, so uh, we have a, dis a deterministic value there. When That's right. You have a deterministic value based on the data that you have seen so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's dollar five, dollar six, five point two five, and five point seven five. Okay. Any other question? So should it be like you hat <coughs> the model instead of? Hat? Yeah, you can put hat here because it depends on the observables. It doesn't matter. Okay. Now I want to hear from you criticism about this particular policy. Yeah. Well, uh, at least so far we haven't gone over er, an upper confidence bound right. um, that actually gives us any of this. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's a good criticism. So what are these functions? Okay. So let's think about let me write some of these functions. Uh, what should I erase? Maybe this side. <laughs> okay. So G T T can be, so depending on the distribution of the underlying random variables and so on, uh, many GTT have been uh, proposed in Lai and Robin's paper. And they are as follows. Well, let me just write it as u hat, u hat jt. And this would change to tjt. OK, so this is in the context of uh, Gaussian random variables. Oh, there has to be a sigma here. So this sigma is, so all the arms have the same uh, same uh, variance, but the mean is kind of unknown, and mean is what, that's the parameter space for the entire distribution. Okay, then for some other random variables, so Bernoulli and so on, they define u hat j t. So this is for Bernoulli. Uh, 
int lambda greater than equal to O, strictly greater than m hat j t such that d k l m hat j t lambda is greater than equal to 2 log t over t j t. Okay, so this is for Gaussian, this is for Bernoulli, and then I want to write for exponential. In this case, you pick m hat jt to be the median of all the rewards that you have observed, and u hat jt has a complicated expression, so I don't want to write it on the board. You can refer to the paper. <clears throat> yes. Why would it be uniformly distributed? Because it's T mode and it's like, if there is a pool that uh, satisfies the condition. Right. So it's like, as T increase step by step, kinds of uniformly distributed amounts of pool. So initially you are right that it will be uniformly distributed. In fact, it will be just sequential, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. But eventually, uh, it won't be uniformly distributed at all. You will pick the arm whose upper confidence bound is lesser than the best mean. No, sorry. You will pick the arm, the best arm more often because the upper confidence bound is going to, is likely to become smaller and smaller and get closer and closer to the mean of the... So let's look at it. This, let, let's look at it here. So when T is very, very large and there is a specific arm that you have explored quite often, uh -huh. then this term is going to be very small, okay. right? So because log t will be small and then this will be large. So therefore, this term is going to be small. So you are almost looking at the empirical mean that you have seen so far. And of course, if an arm is inferior, the empirical mean is going to be lower with high probability to the empirical mean of the arm, which is strictly better. Okay. So. My question is like, can we put this solution based on the gap between the uh, in the condition in e, it's like the n j star minus u cap. It's like if the gap is bigger, uh -huh. you avoid more of the. Of yeah, the but it's the gap is always going to be this. So for the case of Gaussian, u hat j t minus m hat j t uh -huh. seems to be a function of log t and t j t. Okay. Right. So I mean, you can come up with whatever exploration scheme you want. Right. The question is whether it achieves the regret bound, which is of the order of log t or not, okay? So in the assignment, I'm going to give another possible exploration scheme, uh, which was also discussed in the class. I think somebody had mentioned about it. So uh, I don't remember who. So, so you will compute the regret for that particular exploration scheme, and you will see that the regret is actually square root of t, not log of t. So you can come up with whatever exploration scheme you want. That exploration scheme could be bumping up the mean. It could be bumping up the median or some function of the median of all the random variables or all the rewards that you have observed from that particular arm. Or it could have a bit more complicated expression. OK? Uh, you're, you're free to pick whatever exploration scheme you want. The question is really about whether it achieves the optimality, the optimal regret or not. And the optimal regret is order of log t, okay? Some constant multiplied by log t. Yes? So this error depends on my choice of the function, or what does it depend on? So, it, this, 
So, okay, so let's look at mu of t. Mu of t depends on what? So this is easy to compute because it could be a mean, it could be median. This one depends on g of t and tjt, right? So it this, this entire policy depends on the choice of this function, upper confidence bound function, okay? okay. So the error here, the error, the error here depends on this function, right? Right. The error. So how, how can we make it arbitrarily small? So this, this error is a function of delta and perhaps some of the terms you're going to pick here. So this is, this is not the only term you can add. There is a whole bunch of, a family of terms that you can add here. I'm just giving one instance which is easy to understand. Uh, but you could have things like log of t, log log t, okay? Um, and we will see that there is some exploration scheme of this type um, in a few minutes. So, so this gives you a different, a different function, right? And this different function will lead to perhaps a smaller error here. So it just depends on how you, how you pick your gt comma small t. So I mean that what is the property in this function that will make this error small? Oh, uh, remember I had mentioned about three different properties of GTT. Okay. So if you look at those properties, you want the right hand side to be as small as possible. Uh, let me let me write it write one of them. So one was probability of u j t greater than or equal to r should be less than or equal to one minus small o one over t for r less than mean of theta m of theta theta j. Okay, so how small that error would be would depend on what's hidden here. Okay, so that's just one example. And there are many other terms that would, you know, change the error. Okay, so now going back to the question that I had asked a few minutes ago, what's the problem with this policy? What's one of the problem you think is with this policy? So the general argument for us achieving the log t regret bound was extremely abstract mm -hmm. uh, in the three assumptions it required us to make, uh, but uh, the constructive policies we get out of it, we have to have very structured information about the distributions we're planning to encounter. Right. And if we can't prove or have some outside yes. knowledge yes. Uh, that we have those distributions, right. we don't have a constructive way to achieve this. Correct. Okay, so that's a very good point. So the question, the, the, the point that he is trying to make is we need to have a lot of information about the underlying reward distribution in order to compute these upper confidence bounds. And if we don't have the knowledge of the underlying distribution, um, it's unclear whether we can pick an appropriate upper confidence bound to run our multi-arm bandit algorithm. So that's, that's a fair argument. We need underlying distribution. If I ask you to run multi-arm bandit for some powertrain application in a car, what do you know what the distribution is going to look like on the road? Okay, we, we, we don't know. It's very difficult to know something like that. So, so having distributional assumption is kind of very strong. Anything else? Yeah. There's no real separation here between an exploration phase and and the achievement of the maximum phase. So we're always paying right. some degree of a penalty. Yes. A, um, in the limit case, it, right. it will decay, but uh, if we're running it over any degree of finite time, I'm not sure the guarantees we'll get will be convincing or strong. Right, so one thing that you should know is in these kind of algorithms, since you don't quite know what the mean is, and you are just relying on the data and some empirical mean or empirical median of the data to compute or have an understanding of what the actual mean looks like, 
uh, you won't be able to have full confidence unless you have infinite sequence of data from every arm. So the, what this tries to achieve, this algorithm tries to achieve is, uh, you pick the optimal arm, so, so don't quote me, but I'm going to write down the fact that here expected value of pi t is roughly equal to, for, for t sufficiently large, this is roughly equal to log t over, so this is for all non-optimal arms, non-optimal i, dkl theta j theta star. So all non-optimal arms will be roughly picked according to this many number of times at the end of time step capital T. Okay, so you're not, so as, T, as capital T goes to infinity, you are picking this arm infinite number of times. Okay, so it's not like you're gonna stop uh, exploring just because your capital T is one billion or one trillion. Okay, you will continue to explore even when you are one billion or one trillion, it's just that the amount of exploration you will do is very little at that particular point of time. But you will continue to pick those arms um, um, as capital T goes to infinity in order to get infinite sequence of reward from all the arms, okay? Any, any other problem with this? I, I feel that the policy also looks very complicated. I think we could potentially simplify the policy. Uh, and where will we pay a penalty if we, simplify, if, if we try to simplify the policy? Where are we going to pay a penalty? Yeah. Probably the regret bound. Probably the regret bound, okay. So, so there are two things. First, the distributional assumption, which is very complicated. We perhaps don't want to make that kind of distributional assumption because we may not know whether in reality that's going to be true or not. So that's number one. Number two, the policy is too complicated because it requires us to compute a lot of things at every point of time and then compute the policy which is also somewhat more complicated. So motivated by these uh, considerations, a lot of people worked on multi-arm bandits since 1985, so between 1985 to 2000. And one of the most uh, beautiful results came from uh, our et al. in 2002. So I want to write that down. So they made the following assumption. Rewards are in zero comma one. And that's it. Rewards are in zero comma one and the policy they constructed mu capital T I capital T is equal to arg max of J in one to N M hat J T plus square root two
okay reward should be bounded okay so 0 1 is just for uh, just for illustration but as long as rewards are bounded and you know what the bounds are minus 5 to plus 20 or minus 100 to plus 500 so you just need to know the bounds on the rewards as long as rewards are bounded you can pick this particular policy which is an index policy so you look at the empirical mean you bump it up by some function of t and how many times you have picked that particular arm and you pick the maximum of uh, this value and that's your policy at time t and this i t basically is used to compute t j of t and m hat j t this is the empirical mean then their result is the regret mu of t is less than equal to 8 summation log t over delta i delta i greater than 0 plus some constant Yes. How do you, uh, oh, so initially you start with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So first n time steps you pick each arm once. Then you have the value of m hat jt, which is whatever reward you have observed, and you have tjt equals to 1. Okay. So if you think about it, the index at the beginning is uh, infinity. So index of arm i at time 0 is infinity okay so that's one way to initialize the index so the cool thing about this particular uh, result is we will know whether the rewards are bounded or not at least that's something we will know from the actual system so if you are Looking at ad words, you kind of know that, okay, every ad that is clicked, I'm going to get something between $0 and $2. So therefore, the rewards are bounded between 0 and 2. So that part is easy to know from the problem itself um, or the market itself. And the second thing is the policy is extremely simple to compute. It doesn't require very sophisticated uh, computation. And once I compute this, pol once I... Uh, compute the indices which I can update for every arm, then I can just pick the arm that has the maximum index and get done with it. And that particular policy is going to, we are going to get a log t multiplied by some constant. That's the regret that I'm going to get. This constant is very small, so we can ignore it completely. So that particular bound is much higher than this bound that you see here. But it doesn't matter because I'm still getting log t regret as t goes to infinity. So this constant is not very important. Um, so that's the beauty of this particular result. Okay, You achieve log t regret, but with a different constant. And this has spurred a lot of growth and uh, uh, a lot of new class of algorithms that people have designed over the past 20 or so years, maybe 18 years. Uh, based on this very simple idea that rewards are bounded and you pick an index policy with an appropriately defined term here. Now one thing to note here is that this is the mean that you have observed and this is the term that gets added to the mean and that induces exploration. Okay, So this whole idea is now known as uh, optimism in the face of uncertainty. I haven't picked this arm a lot and so I have some empirical mean of the reward that I've observed. Uh, but I'm optimistic about it, so I'm going to add a constant, a fictitious term to the mean 
in order to explore that particular arm more in the future. Okay, so this this phenomena is known as uh, optimism in the face of uncertainty. So I'm faced with an uncertain situation, but I'm optimistic about it. So even though I have lower mean that I've observed so far, I'm going to bump it up so that I explore that particular arm um, more often in the future. Okay, so now people say that multi-arm bandit has this underlying feature that we want to be optimistic in the face of uncertainty. If you are uncertain about certain arm, we need to pull it more often. So how do you induce exploration? Well, you add some, something to the mean and then try and explore that particular arm more often. Okay, we'll get into the proof of this particular result in a few minutes, but I want to write down another such policy. So this is asymptotically optimal. UCB. This is chapter 8 of Latimore and Stepeshwari 2020. This is a book that's available online for free and I've posted the link to Carmen page. So there is a variant of this particular policy where your mu t of i t is argmax of j m hat j t plus square root 2 log 1 plus t log t square over log tjt. The square root is over the entire thing. <coughs> and the regret is less than equal to some constant c summation delta i greater than 0, delta i plus log t over delta i. <coughs> this is a universal constant. Yes. Uh, well, this is the term that the somebody played with and figured that asymptotically, this is the best regret you can get. Um, so, so this particular term is almost equal to one over delta i. Okay, so this term that you see here, it's almost equal to one over delta i. Well, not almost equal, but one over delta i is a bound on that particular term. And so this, um, besides this delta i term, which is a constant, so we don't worry about it, it gives you c over delta i result for c over delta i as the constant for log t. And that's the regret you achieve from this particular strategy. Okay, so it's asymptotically optimal in the sense that when log t is very, very large or t is very, very large, then this regret is almost, the upper bound on the regret is almost similar to this particular regret, okay.
But note that this, this doesn't have any KL divergence in the denominator, and this has KL divergence. So KL divergence is defined only when the two distributions have are absolutely continuous with respect to each other, so it, there has to be uh, a density function associated with the distribution. This one doesn't make use of any of that idea. So you could have, for instance, a Bernoulli um, random variable and a uniformly distributed random variable. So in that case, DKL would be infinity because it doesn't exist, but delta i would still be easy to compute. So in some sense, you get rid of all the distributional assumption um, just by assuming that the rewards are bounded in some set. Yeah? Is there any uh, theory behind getting that term, or is it just risk? Yeah, so once I go over the proof for this particular result, you will see what the steps consist of. So I'm not going to go through the entire proof, but I'm going to go through all the steps in the proof. And you will see that by carefully designing this term through perhaps trial and error, um, you will be able to optimize this constant, which is what these authors have tried to do. And perhaps use some different proof technique and all that, but. Okay, any question? Yes? How to design the T J of T? This one? Yeah, because this is a QMI. I mean. That's right. So. so as you can see, this particular has a completely different term, right? That you use, that you add to the M hat. So that's what I was discussing or I was telling him that uh, people since 2000, so this paper was written in 2002, so people since 2002 have played around with this term a lot in order to figure out which one is going to give you the best regret bound. Okay, so, yeah. Any other question? Okay, so ready for the proof of this particular theorem? Brace for impact. Okay. Ah. All right, so I'm going to erase everything. Uh, I hope there are no further questions, so. Okay, so I hope everyone remembers the expression for regret. The expression for regret was under some policy mu at time t equals to summation delta i, i equals one to n expected value of t i So if I want to find the regret, what should I do for some policy? Estimate this term, okay? So I need to estimate this term. What should I, what should I do to estimate? So remember, I want an upper bound, right? So I want an upper bound on the regret. So I need to find an upper bound to this expectation in order to compute an upper bound. So delta i is strictly positive. Well, not strictly positive, but non-negative. So I need to find an upper bound on expected value of ti of t. So what I'll start with is find an upper bound of ti of t itself. Okay, so if you go through this paper, um, step one is T i of t, so this is non-optimal i, so let me write T i of t is less than or equal to L plus summation t equals one to infinity summation 
s equal to 1 to t minus 1 summation s i equals to l to t minus 1 indicator So C T comma S is square root two log T over S. T Let's parse through this particular expression. Okay, and this has to be true for every L. This is true for every L in N. Okay, so there is some optimal arm. So let's let's look at this expression. There is some optimal arm, which I have pulled s number of times, where s goes from one to t minus one, plus CTS. Okay, so let's think about this term, this exploration term, in a few minutes. Uh, and then this is the empirical mean of the non-optimal arm i that I'm trying to estimate uh, when I'm currently at at time t and I have picked this particular arm si number of times where si goes from l to t minus 1. So in some sense I already know that I have picked this particular arm l number of times and then I want to look at what happens to this expression after l number of times uh, and then plus this exploration term. Now this is an indicator function that is saying I am going to pick arm i which is non-optimal arm only if the index for arm i is greater than or equal to the index for the optimal arm at that particular time. Okay? So what is the index for the optimal arm? Well, it is m hat j star plus cts because that's the index I started with. And this is the index for the non-optimal arm i when you have pulled the arm i at least si number of times, not at least si, but exactly si number of times, where SI goes from L to capital, well, this is small t, t minus 1. And instead of uh, taking t equals 1 to capital T, I just bump it up to infinity, okay, just for kicks. So I just need an upper bound, so I don't need to consider capital T. I can take it to infinity because this whole term is positive. So this is a bound that comes after a series of calculation, which I don't want to do on the board. Uh, but this is one way. This is one way to estimate an upper bound on expected on the realization of Ti of capital T. So that's step one. Now step two. Let's take the expectation. That will be less than equal to L plus summation, summation, summation. What's the expectation of the indicator function? Sorry? Probability. probability. So probability of m hat j star s plus c t s less than equal to m at i t s i plus c t s i. Okay, 
I want to get an upper bound to this whole summation. How should I do that? So let's, let's look at this probability. This is a random variable. This is a random variable. I want to estimate what's the probability that a random variable is less than or equal to some other random variable. OK? How do I get an upper bound to this expression? Okay, so let's think about it. I have A of omega, I have B of omega, and I want to know P of A of omega less than or equal to B of omega less than or equal to what? How can I find a bound? Sorry? So what's the theorem? Mm-hmm. There is uh, going to be no expectation here in order to get the bound. Okay, so maybe that the theorem could be applied, but that's not what the authors use. So let's, yeah. Yeah, but we don't, you don't quite know what the distribution of this random variable is. So how do you, you can do the conditional, but then you have to have the distribution or some bound on the distribution. So let's uh, look at a lemma. So pick A greater than B. Probability of A omega less than or equal to B omega is less than or equal to probability of A less than or equal to A plus probability of B greater than or equal to B. So this AB is any constant, A comma B in R. You can pick according to your your choice, as long as A is greater than B. So let's uh, try to prove this statement. Uh, it, it's actually a very simple statement as long as you know how to prove it, okay? So the proof is uh, as follows. Let me define omega naught as the set of omega such that A omega is less than or equal to B omega. Omega one as omega such that A of omega is less than or equal to A omega 2 is equal to omega such that b of omega is greater than or equal to b. So I define three sets. What do I need to show? Uh, well, omega naught is a subset of omega 1 union omega 2. So need to show Omega zero is a subset of omega one union omega two. And then I can apply the union bound to get the inequality. I hope that step is clear to everyone. Uh, so, th so some of these arguments are uh, critical to the proof, but if you're not interested in proof, uh, you can shut down for the time being. Uh, I understand that there are quite a few masters and undergrads who perhaps don't care about the proof, but 
I still have to teach it. All right, so I want to prove this holds, but this is equivalent to saying omega naught complement Omega naught complement contains omega 1 complement intersection omega 2 complement. Now, how do I prove this? I need to prove that if I pick an omega in omega 1 complement intersection omega 2 complement, then this implies that omega is an omega naught complement. These are all equivalent statements. Now let's pick an omega that is an omega 1 complement intersection omega 2 complement. So this means A of omega is greater than A and B of omega is less than B. Right? And I know that B is less than A. That's by choice. That's that's how I've picked the values of A and B. So what does this imply? Yeah. Okay. So I pick an omega that is an omega 1 complement and omega 2 complement. So omega 1 complement is A of omega greater than A. Omega 2 complement is B of omega less than B. And I know from my choice of B and A that B is less than A. So this implies that B of omega is less than A of omega. which is the same as saying omega is an omega 0 complement. That's the proof. Okay. Okay, so we have seen two tricks so far. The first trick is to upper bound the number of times you have picked an optimal, uh, picked a non-optimal arm i. Uh, this is a gross estimation on the higher side. This, so, so this estimate, this is hi highly overestimated. Okay, because you have things going all the way to infinity, and things going so many, t going all the way from one to t minus one, and so on. So, this is basically highly overestimating ti of t but that's fine as long as things work out in the end so then the second thing is well i can just take the expectation on both the sides and i'm going to get probability of a random variable less than or equal to probability of another random variable then i hit a roadblock how do i estimate this probability and then you realize that oh well if i have to do estimate this probability, I have to find an upper bound on this probability. So the way to do it is pick A greater than B, and then I can just compute probability of A less than or equal to A, probability of B greater than or equal to B, and I'm going to be done. Just I just have to add it up. Okay, so let's try to do this. So this is less than or equal to L plus summation, summation, summation probability of m hat j star s is i have to do less than equal to so less than equal to m star plus c t s i uh, 
Oh, uh, okay. Maybe CTS plus plus probability of M hat I T S I greater than equal to M I, which is the mean of the ith arm, the actual true mean plus Oh, this has to be negative, yeah. And this has to be positive, C, T, S, I. Okay. Uh, you know, let me just check whether this is CTSI or CTS. So I'll tell you in one minute. M star minus CTS. And this is CT, CTSI. Okay, so I'm, I'm right. So these are the two things. So these are the two probabilities I need to find out. Okay. Everyone understands the step here. Okay, so I'm just applying that particular lemma. And now the problem boils down to computing these two probabilities. Oh, and I also have to prove one thing, right? What, what do I have to prove? Well, I have to prove that Yeah, this term has to be greater than this term, right? So it turns out, so remember there is this term hanging around L and your SI goes from L to T minus one, right? So if I pick L large enough, it turns out that this term is going to be greater than this term for all values of SI greater than or equal to L. So let me write that down. Okay, let me write it here. So I'm going to pick L equal to 8 log T over delta I square. And this is the ceiling function. So this is the largest integer, so smallest integer above 8 log T over delta I square. So if I pick this, then this would imply that A and this is B, this would imply that A is greater than B. Okay. Now we need to compute these uh, these equalities, or, or sorry, these probabilities, or estimate these probabilities. Any thoughts on how to do that? Yes. This one. So remember, SI goes from L to T minus one. So SI is always greater than or equal to L. Uh, CTS is given by this expression, right? Uh, so all you have to check is M star plus CTS is greater than MI plus CTSI for all SI greater than or equal to L, which is this number, right? That's all you need to show. 
and m star minus m i is delta i plus c t s minus c t s i is greater than zero for all s i greater than or equal to l given by this expression, yeah. m star minus c t s, isn't it? Because that's what you have defined as a. Or oh, yeah, 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 of course, of course. Uh, minus, and this is plus. OK, that's fine. Minus. OK, so if you pick L, if you pick L in this fashion, and you plug in the value of CT of S here, you will find that this expression is satisfied. OK. All right, now we need to estimate this term, and I'm going to use concentration of measure so this is a big topic but we are going to use a specific result called uh, chernoff hoefding bound chernoff hoefding bound which says y i i equals one to t i i d and bounded between zero and one doesn't matter what distribution it is okay as long as it is i i d and define st as summation yi i equals 1 to t. So that's the summation of all the rewards that you have observed so far from a specific arm. Uh, then probability of st greater than equals to t, m, m is the mean, plus a is less than equal to exponential minus 2a square over t and probability st less than equal to tm minus a is less than exponential minus 2a square over t. M is the mean. M is the mean of the distribution. Okay, so this uh, inequality is extremely famous uh, in uh, probability and statistics literature called chernoff hoefding bound. Uh, I think this came from a paper written in 1963 by Hoefding, making use of Chernoff's inequality. So therefore, both of their name got attached to this particular bound. It basically says if you have sum of IID variables, uh, how far that sum is with respect to the mean, okay? So you want to look at TM plus A, so this is the mean of the sum, 
plus some number a, some value a, how does it depend on a and how does it depend on t? And the same thing for the other side of the mean. And it, turns, it comes out to be this expression. It requires bounded uh, values between 0 and 1. Um, but you can extend it to, to cases where you have bounds which are not 0 and 1. So you could have minus 15 to plus 25. It's fine. You can find the appropriate bound using chernoff holding inequality. OK? So now you see that this particular expression is exactly in that form. So this is the mean is less than or equal to m star minus CTS and the mean greater than or equal to mi plus CTS. So now you can use these exponential terms and by plugging in the appropriate value of CTS, you can actually show that expected value of TIT is less than or equal to 8 log t over delta i plus some constant. OK? Now, the important thing here are the two claims that I made. So one claim was about bounding this probability. The other claim is this uh, chernoff holding bound. OK? So pick any algorithm analysis for reinforcement learning. These are the three steps that every paper follows. The first step obtain an upper bound on ti of t okay so this is of course an overestimation over overestimation but of course if you get a tighter estimation you get a tighter bound okay so that's the first step use all your intelligence to find this upper bound as tight upper bound as you can the second part is now you have changed that upper bound so expectation of that upper bound is equal to summation of some probability Okay, so once it becomes estimation of probability of a random variable less than or equal to some other random variable, then you split this particular probability into probability of one plus probability of another. Okay, two events. When you get to this particular step, you use concentration of measure result. You can use chernoff holding You can use some other complicated concentration of measure result. It doesn't matter. Mostly it is chernoff holding Use this bound to get an upper bound on the expectation. Remember that in all these situations, you are doing less than equal to less than equal to so many times. You are making a gross oversimplification, gross uh, estimation, like uh, not gross estimation. You are doing overestimation of the underlying quantity, underlying random variable. So you have less than equal to here. So you start with less than equal to here. Then you start with less than or equal to here. Then you have less than or equal to and less than or equal to here. So what you get here is a much, much higher estimate of the actual expected value. Okay? But nonetheless, uh, it still achieves log t. Okay? You have a different constant, but you have log t. And that's the most important part that people care about. So your regret doesn't grow with t. No, it, it grows with t, but it grows according to log t, not square root of t or t square or t raised to 5 or things like that. So that's the good thing about um, this whole analysis. So when you're considering policies for your use in, in a multi-armed bandit uh, yes. uh, problem like this, once you get to the fact that it has a log t regret bound, right. do you switch to caring solely about the empirical results because of, of how uh, large the overestimates are that just show they're in the same asymptotic class? And then yes. And then, okay. Yes, yes. So you want to make sure that your regret has log t. And in order to, so many a times what would happen is someone would come up with uh, the CTS term, the exploration term come up with a regret bound, somebody will 
tighten the proof, tighten the regret bound over period of time or maybe add some small terms here and there to get a better bound, better constant in this particular region. But as long as you have log t and you have a good constant here, it doesn't look like 1 billion, people are generally happy about it. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the, now the other good thing about this particular algorithm is this regret bound is not asymptotic in nature, so there is no limb soup, limb in here. This is true for every possible value of t, so this is for all t in n. Okay, so even if you stop your simulation at time t equals to 1000, you still of the order of log t, whereas the Lie and Robbins result said limb soup of capital T goes to infinity. So unless you go into that asymptotic regime where your capital T is 1 trillion or 10 trillion or whatever, some very large number, you don't actually hit the log t term, the asymptotic optimality term. Okay? So that's the beauty of uh, this particular uh, paper. So this was one of the first papers that came up with this regret bound for all t in n. So it was not asymptotic in nature. And it's not like they just came, it came out of the blue. You know, there was quite a bit of work done in 1990s to improve the exploration term. So this is sort of an aggregate culmination of uh, a lot of work that was done in 90s. And then after that, of course, many people have come up with different exploration schemes and come up with the regret bounds, but all the regret bounds would have a step one, step two, and step three in the same sequence. So that's why I wanted to show you the outline of the proof. So we did skip quite a few steps, but the outline is important. And there are two extra results that were needed. One was the splitting of probability result, and the second one was the concentration of measure result. So this is a result that we will revisit time and again throughout this class. Any question? All right, so we'll see you guys on Thursday.